Welcome to your weekly lowdown of all things arts and culture in the Northeast. I'm Olivia Swash. So we'll start with Newcastle-based Guy Mankowski, whose third novel tells the story of an eccentric frontman who struggles to make a name for himself in the 1980s northern post-punk scene, before vanishing off the radar after a controversial Top of the Pops appearance. I caught up with Guy to find out which aspects of the 80s are still relevant today. What made you choose to set um, your book in the North? Well, I saw a lot of parallels between um, what life was like in the 80s in the North and what it's like now. So the whole recession era has kind of come back again. And the big kind of motivation for me was that um, in the 80s, with the region kind of being starved of funding, it was quite difficult for people artistically to kind of create um, something original. And uh, post-punk bands responded to that in a really dynamic way. And I see that kind of again happening now with everything kind of being... Um, with the kind of the cuts there are now and, and, and the kind of lack of investment that there are in the arts, there's the same kind of situation now that artists are having to respond to. So I sort of saw parallels within that mm -hmm. um, in the North. And um, I've just lived in the North for 10 years and so it's kind of the area in which I'm um, sort of familiar with and, um, and kind of it just sort of inspired me naturally that way, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So what about the post-punk scene specifically? Do you want to write about that? Um, I think it's really fascinating because the, the post-punk scene um, in the north, I mean Manchester and sort of in Newcastle as well, what it is is, um, particularly in the 80s, is people kind of responding to a really kind of bad environment in which there's a lack of money and kind of dark industrial kind of climate in a really inspiring way and kind of creating um, in post-punk music kind of really um, unusual kind of form of art that was about kind of self-discipline and um, about uh, being autonomous and not relying on big record companies and I found that scene just so inspiring and, and, and lots of books are being written about it and lots of films being made about it because I think we're looking back and we're starting to as a culture go that, that kind of post-punk scene really kind of showed the way about how to respond to that situation and I, I yeah, just find that very inspiring mm -hmm. really. I suppose. So it's kind of, is, is it political would you say? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's really um in 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 the book um quite early on uh, my main character Robert Wardner talks about um sort of Margaret Thatcher and um he, there's a kind of a lot of anger that's there and I saw parallels between the kind of anger that people had about Thatcher then and the anger that I hear in the music of say the Chapman family from kind of Teesside side and um it, it's kind of echoing it was it was around then and it's kind of around now um and yeah, it still seems, that sentiment seems quite alive to me still. So really. it's still relevant. That's yeah, yeah. I, there's a lot of there's a lot of parallels between the early '80s and now, and um, yeah, I mean even if even if you look at somewhere like um, London, where there's lots of kind of they call it kind of new money coming in from places like Russia, and but but you know, um, is that necessarily being invested in the infrastructure, or is it? This is what happens when you have a conservative government. Lots of very rich people kind of get to flood things, and it doesn't trickle down. It was the same problem then and it's mm. the same problem now. So there's kind of artistically and economically kind of big echoes for me from the 80s and then and then today, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So did your, um, you have kind of a history of music journalism. Did that help you write the, the book? Yeah, it did, actually, yeah. Um, I was really lucky because early on when I was writing the book, I sent a tweet to Jenny Beth from Savages, uh, who are a sort of post-punk band who nominated for the Mercury Prize and things. And she replied back saying, well, why don't you interview me about this and, and you can ask me properly? And and I interviewed her and it was kind of really kind of interesting conversation. And then off the back of that, I got to interview some other people like um, Lady Tron and Gazelle Twin and then the Chapman family. And I got to learn about, I'd been in bands myself, but I got to learn what it's like to be in a really successful band mm -hmm. in, in this sort of day and age. And um, I wouldn't have had that insight for the book mm -hmm. if she hadn't have sent me that tweet. So what, what aspects of, their, of those research interviews did you actually kind of put into the book? Um, probably quite a lot of the humour, actually, to be honest. Um, the, we can see rock stars as being really glamorous and having a really exciting life, but just what it's actually like to turn up at a venue at five o'clock and your sound check's not for two hours and having to eat at the local Weatherspoons. And I learned what it's really like, you know, we can see people as really famous and glamorous and sexy, but what it's actually like in the rain on a Wednesday afternoon. And there's lots of connecting bits in the book. I really wanted to look at the kind of pomposity of 
pop stars in that way. Or having um, a, a kind of a part-time job at a bar is at the same time, exactly. that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, you know, um, on the one hand, I mean, bands like the Manic Street Preachers are sort of good examples. You know, on the one hand, coming from a really kind of uh, depressed place like kind of Blackwood in Wales, and on the other hand, being incredibly glamorous and vivid and um, and inspiring and intellectual, and 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 just how quickly as people we move between those, as artists we move between those worlds. You know, w yeah, one minute you're in the pub on your own and it's raining outside, and then the next minute thousands of people are cheering you, and you're you're the same person. And um, so, what about? Um well, you trained as a psychologist, so how did how was the transition between between being a psychologist and something so creative, such as writing? Um, well, the reason I wanted to be a psychologist, actually, I think was nosiness. I think <laughs> I was just really interested in hearing people's stories and uh, kind of about their inner world and what their life's really like. Um, and that's what you, I think you do in writing fiction. It's a really good way of, you, you can create a character and you get to kind of explore what their inner world would be. You know, if you meet someone and you think, they're really kind of intriguing, what would their life be like? You, you can kind of do that in a valid way in a book. So, so to me, there's a continuation between the two. I think you can do it better as a writer than you can as a psychologist, actually. Oh, so what's, what's next for you? Um, well, uh, a script version of this book has been written with a comedian um, from Manchester called Greg Fox. And um, it's kind of like we're aiming for kind of a, a spinal tap set in the northeast. So kind of all about... It's the same story as this book, but it's about the kind of pomposity of English pop stars that um, people who I love, people like Morrissey and sort of Mark E. Smith, but who are in incredibly kind of um, eccentric pop stars, even though they're on a completely kind of shoestring budget. You know, that, that kind of ridiculousness I don't think has been looked at in a kind of a fond way. So we're doing a film script about that.